So 1 Kings chapter 20, and Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together, and there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots, and he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. Remember, Samaria is the capital city of Israel which was the northern kingdom. At this time during Kings, you, in the book of Kings, you had the northern kingdom, which was Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was Judah. They were split up in the days of uh, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. So anyway, there was two different kingdoms. Samaria is the capital of Israel. Judah actually was a pretty good, they did pretty good. They had a lot of good godly kings, but Israel, they... They started off, Jeroboam started them off on the wrong, he started them off worshiping the calf, worshiping bull gods like they had in Egypt. And uh, it just went downhill ever since. Uh, So this Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, he comes and you notice he brings with him 32 kings. Remember when uh, George Bush had that uh, alliance in Iraq? The coalition of all these nations again, you know, trying to stop Saddam Hussein, and and uh, but can you imagine? Thirty-two kingdoms are coming with him against this little place called Israel, and Israel doesn't really have much protection because this is an evil king. And so he came, he besieged the city of Samaria. Now, besieged means. Pretty much that he surrounded the city. And they used to do this in, in days of antiquity. They would, so, because you had, you, a lot of times you had these walled cities. But the people needed food and water to come into the city. So they would surround the city and cut them off from food and water. Now, some of the great cities, like when we talked in Jonah, remember we got in Jonah, we said there were 650,000 people that lived in Nineveh, and they produced in the city enough food and water right there to take care of 650,000 people. So you couldn't do that to this that city. But they surrounded this city. They were going to wait them out. Then this king Ben-Hadad of Syria, he sent messengers to Ahab, the king of Israel, into the city. And he said unto him, Thus saith Ben-Hadad, The silver, thy silver and thy gold is mine. Thy wives also and thy children, even the goodliest, are mine. So he's saying, I'm, you know, I want your gold, your silver, your wives, your children. And the king of Israel answered, now, he's, he's afraid. I mean, he's surrounded by 32 kings. And he was no match for Syria to begin with. And now there's 32 kings with him. <clears throat> so the king of Israel answered, now he can't turn to God because he don't even believe in God. He, believe, he worships Baal, remember? Him and his wife Jezebel. Well, they're, they're, I mean, they didn't because uh, because of Elijah proving who God was and whose God answered by fire. That they didn't repent and start worshiping the true God. So this king is afraid. This king of Israel, and he so he says, "My Lord, O King, according to thy saying, I am thine in all that I have." In other words, I will give you everything you're asking for. I will give you my silver, my gold. You know, and, and that's he lives in a palace, right? He's got the silver and gold of the nation, and his children and all his wives. Now, in in those days, the kings had a bunch of wives. In fact, um, it wasn't a negative thing. A lot of times, no. today we think that. Right. But um, uh, David, for instance, a, a man after God's own heart, he had 300 wives. What? Right? Oh, uh, what about Solomon? Solomon had like a couple thousand or something. <laughs> <clears throat> so anyway, uh, or, or was it, seven, I don't know, 700 wives and 300 concubines? or something? I don't remember. I think it was 300. Anyway, so... Uh, so the king says, I'll give you my wives, I'll give you my children, I'll give you my silver, I'll give you my gold. But the king wasn't satisfied with that. That's what he asked for. And the king said, I'll go ahead and do that. But in verse 5 it says, 
And the messengers came again and said, Thus speaketh Ben-Hadad, saying, Although I have sent unto thee, saying, Thou shalt deliver me thy silver and thy gold and thy wives and thy children, yet I will send my servants unto thee tomorrow about this time. They shall search thy house and the houses of thy servants. It shall be that whatsoever is pleasant in thine eyes, they shall put it in their hand and take it away. This guy's crazy. And, I mean, imagine this. Imagine this. Our Probably our greatest threat, potentially, to if, if you look at how could the United States be taken over, probably China would be the one. China has this amazing um, military already. And just think if China got us into a situation where they said, we want your gold. Your silver, you know, and they, I want your, I want Ivanka, <laughs> right? His children. But then he comes back and he says, now I want, I want to be able to, I'm going to send my servant. I'm going to go through all of your houses and whatever we see, whatever we like, we're taken. How would you like to live through that? You know, you wouldn't have anything worth living for. All you'd have is is dirt, right? They they would take everything. He says, uh, 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 verse 7, Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man seeketh mischief. For he sent unto me for my wives, my children, my silver, my gold, and I denied him not. And all the elders and all the people said unto him, Hearken not unto him, nor consent. Wherefore he said unto the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king all that thou d- didst send uh, for to thy servant. At the first I will do, but this thing I may not do. And the messengers departed and brought him word again. And Ben-Hadad sent unto him and said, The gods do so unto me, and more also, if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for the handfuls for all the people that follow me. Now that's kind of reads pretty rough we're not we're not really used to that but what it's saying what the king is saying is is um well it, he says the gods do so unto me and more also like i'm going to do to you in other words there will not be when i get done with this city and this people and these homes and there will not even be dust there will not even be enough dust for everyone that's with me to have a handful that's quite a, quite a devastation is what, what he, he's, he's actually cursing them. And the king of Israel, verse 11, uh, answered and said, Tell him, let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. In other words, he's saying, it's not, it's not really, you really shouldn't be boasting about the victory when the war is only going to begin. The king of Israel didn't back down here. But he's, he's in a lot of trouble here. 32 kings against him. And verse 12, it came to pass when Ben-Hadad heard this message as he was drinking. Now, he wasn't drinking Kool-Aid. What do you think he was drinking? Lemonade. Alcohol. What my point is, he's getting drunk. The Proverbs actually says it's, it, this um, getting drunk is not what kings are supposed to, or men in authority are supposed to do. You make a lot of mistakes when you're intoxicated. It came to pass when Ben-Hadad heard this message, we're in 1 Kings 20, verse 12, uh, as he was drinking, he and the kings, so all 32 kings, and they were having this party, right? In the pavilions. And he said to his servants, set yourself in array, and they set themselves in array against the city, and behold... There came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel. Now, is, remember, King Ahab is a terrible, wicked king, right? But God is watching the whole thing. And God's a little upset that 32 kings are coming against Israel because he still cares about Israel. And so he sends his prophet to Ahab. And he says, thus saith the Lord, hast thou seen all this great multitude? 
You know, when, the, when, when, you get, when you're going through something and it looks devastating, it looks like it, there's no way out, that's when God can come on strong and show you that He is who He is and He can turn it around, right? God likes to do that because nobody gets the glory except for God. This is when, when He can exercise His power. We're talking about like, uh, you know, Moses parting the waters, that kind of thing. God gets a lot of glory out of that, right? So God, through the prophet, says, Have you seen all this great multitude, these 32 kings coming again? Behold, I will deliver it into thy hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And you'll notice Lord is in capital letters. And when you see Lord in capital letters there in the King James Bible, what it means is that's God's divine name. That, that, that's the one true God. Okay, so if you see the L-O-R-D, but it's not in capital, it's not God's name. But he said, you will know that I am Jehovah, or I am Yahweh, however you want to pronounce it. In verse 14, and Ahab said, by whom? <laughs> God says, I'm going to overthrow all these. And Ahab's like kind of in shock. He says, by whom? Who's going to overthrow? Who are you going to use? And he said, thus saith the Lord, even by the young men of the princes of the provinces. Then he said, who shall order the battle? And he said, he answered, thou. <laughs> Which means you. You. You're going to do it. And Ahab's like, moi? <laughs> right? I mean, he, he's, he's got to be shaking in his boots if he had boots. <laughs> <laughs> and now remember, we just, he just went through three and a half years of famine and drought. They're just starting to recover, right? Yeah. And so he says to the Lord, the Lord's probably, he said, by whom? And he said, he said, who shall order the battle? He said, you, thou will do it. Verse 15, then he numbered the young men of the princes of the provinces, the king did, and they were 232. So God is saying 232 guys he's going to raise up from the kingdom, their, their royalty, their princes in, in Israel. And with those uh, 200, what was it? Uh, two, 232, with those he's going to overcome all these 32 kings. There's hundreds and th- probably thousands and thousands, right? There's got to be a multitude of thousands, maybe 200,000. Well, in fact, we'll see. Um, he kills 100,000, uh, and then they run. So there's, there's more than that, but uh, as we get down here. So he, he numbered the young men of the princes. There were 232, and after them he numbered all the people, even all the, the children of Israel, and they were about 7,000. So they only have 7,000, right? I mean, that's total. They have 7,000 children of Israel, and 232 of them are these princes that are supposed to get the victory. Verse 16, and they went out at noon, but Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk in the pavilions. He and the kings, the 32, 30 and 2 kings that helped him, And the young men of the princes of the provinces went out first. In other words, they went out to war. The king doesn't even know what's going on. The the king of Syria, he's drunk. And 32 other kings are drunk. They're not even watching. And he says, the young men of the princes of the provinces of Israel went out first. And Ben-Hadad sent out and told him, saying, there are men come out of Samaria. And he said... Whether they be come out for peace, take them alive. Or whether they be come out for war, take them alive. Take take them alive. I don't care what you do. He already thinks he won. Now, I don't know if it's the alcohol talking, but this guy, he has an arrogancy problem. He really thinks he's something. He does not expect this guy kingdom of Israel, this city of Israel or nation of Israel to be able to war against him and win he said whether they come uh, they be come out for peace take them alive or whether they be come out for war take them alive and in verse 18 it says 
whether they come out for peace, take them alive, or whether they come out for war, take them alive. So, verse 19, these young men of princes of the provinces came out of the city and the army which followed them, and they slew every one his man. In other words, they were just knocking them all off, right? Every one that went after somebody, they killed them, and then they went off after the next guy. Because remember, there's only, what, what was it, 232? Verse 20, they slew every one his man, and the Syrians fled. And Israel pursued them. And Ben-Hadad, the king of Israel, escaped on a horse with horsemen. And the king of Israel went out and smote the horses and the chariots and slew the Syrians with a great slaughter. And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto them, Go strengthen thyself and mark and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come up against thee. So what what is he saying here when he says, uh, he says, go strengthen thyself in Mark and see what thou doest. In other words, what he's saying is, he's he's saying to the the king, he said, don't be thinking yourself so wonderful because you escaped this and that you won the great victory because this guy's coming back. And you need to instead, and don't, don't waste the time. You need to go. You need to inspect. What did I do right? What did I do wrong? Set, start setting out some strategic plan because this guy's going to come back. And you need to be ready for him. That's what he's saying here. In verse 23, And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hill. Therefore, they were stronger than we. In other words, they're saying, now they're calling Israel's gods in plural, like they believed in gods, right? There's only one true God. But in all fairness, Israel was worshiping false gods. Remember, they had all these false prophets. And so they were worshiping false gods here. Anyway, it says... uh, they, they're saying their gods are gods of the hills, therefore they were stronger than us, but let's fight against them in the plain, and surely we will be stronger than them. Because our gods are gods of the plain. And that's folly, complete folly. They've completely missed it. God gave them the victory. God delivered his people, right? It's not because God was the god of the hills, but this Syria, uh, this king of Syria, he has um, uh, wise men that aren't so wise. Verse 23, And the servants of the king of Syria said, Their gods are gods of the hill, therefore they were stronger than we, but let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And do this thing, take the kings away, every man out of his place, put captains in their rooms, and number thee an army like the army that thou hast lost, horse for horse, chariot for chariot. We will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto their voice, and did so. So what their recommendation was is whatever army you lost, let's go ahead and replace it the same number. Because they're saying we lost because we fought in the hills, and their God is a God of the hills. But if we fight them in the plains with the same number of people, we will win because our gods are the gods of the plains. Well, I think our God... <laughs> has a different uh, idea about the different outcome of this war here. Anyway, so they think they're going to annihilate them. Uh, verse 24, do this thing, take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in the rooms, number thee an army like the army that hast, thou hast lost, horse for horse, chariot for chariot. We will fight against them in the plain, and surely we'll be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto their voice, and did so, and it came to pass at the return of the year that Ben-Hadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel, just like God's prophet told the king, then they were going to come back. And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country because there were so many of them. And to them, it looked like Israel, like a, like a shepherd had two little flocks. That was their army. And this, this other army, this was massive. 28, and there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel. I like when the man of God comes. Now, this is not Elijah, by the way. This is another prophet. You notice he's anonymous. Sometimes you don't always have a prophet that makes a great name for himself. 
Sometimes you've got these faithful prophets that come out of the woodwork. You don't know who they are, but they do these mighty things. They, they come in the name of God. Not every one of us is going to make a name for ourselves. In fact, we shouldn't be trying to make a name for ourselves. We should just be busy doing what God wants us to do, right? Let the people that want to make a name for themselves, let them have the name for themselves. Verse 29, they pitched one over against the other seven days, and so it was that in the seventh day the battle was joined. In other words, they, the Israel pitched next to them. They looked like the two little flocks. There was this massive army, and they sat there looking at each other for about seven days, and nobody would do anything. And then on the seventh day, Israel went forward into war. Okay? So they crossed the line. You ever see that thing where, you know, you got, when you're, when you're younger, maybe, maybe at school there's going to be a fight at school. <clears throat> and so, uh, so that you got the, you know, you got the, the two boys after school and, and, and the one boy standing over here and the other boys standing over here. And, and they're like, well, come on, come on. You want to take me? Come on, take me. And then the other boy said, he don't want to fight. Neither one of them really want to fight. Because they don't know what's gonna, what the outcome is, right? So he picks up a rock. He puts it on, on his shoulder. He said, knock that rock off. <laughs> and so he knocks the rock off. And he <laughs> puts another one up there. Now try that one. <laughs> and then, but, but eventually you run out of rocks, right? And the, and the fight is on, right? Mm-hmm. Well, after the seventh day, the fight was on. <clears throat> And they pitched over against each other for seven days. So it was in the seventh day the battle was joined, and the children of Israel slew of the Syrians a hundred thousand footmen in one day. So there was a hundred thousand, hundred thousand of them were killed in one day. They had a lot more, and there were only seven thousand total Israel, their children of Israel. But the rest fled to Aphek into the city. So they, they escaped. They went into Aphek into the city. And there, there fell a wall upon 27,000 of them and killed them. So he, they lost 100,000 in war. And then they escaped and a wall fell down on them and killed 27. I mean, that, was, that must have been like being downtown Chicago. The, the building fell on you or something. Verse 30, but the rest fled to Aphek into the city, and their, their wall fell upon them, uh, uh, 20 and 7,000 of the men that were left. And Ben-Hadad fled and came into the city into an inner chamber. And his servants said unto him, Behold now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our heads and go out to the king of Israel, peradventure he will save thy life. Now this must be some type of, the sackcloth represents their humbling themselves and the rope around their heads, it must represent something of them uh, saying that they will be their slaves. That's the only thing I can figure. Other than that, what, why they would put ropes in their heads. And they came to the king of Israel and said, Thy servant Ben-Hadad saith, I pray thee, let me live. And he said, Is he yet alive? And he answers his own question. And then he says, He is my brother. Now, why would he call, why would the king Ahab call the king of Syria his brother? Now, king of Syria is, you know, like, almost like crawling, asking for peace. And so the king, king of Israel calls him his brother. And that really is terminology when you uh, uh, enter into a covenant relationship, you become brothers. You heard the, the expression blood brothers, right? So he's trying to, he wants to make a covenant with them. And so... He, he uh, says he is my brother. In other words, I'll accept him as, as if he was my brother. So verse 33, now the men did diligently, these are the Syrians, uh, they did, did diligently observe whether anything would come from him and did hastily catch it. In other words, they were looking to see what the response was. And when he said he is my brother, they knew that 
he was offering them this covenant of peace. Uh, And then they said, Thy brother Ben-Hadad, then he said, Go, ye bring him. Then Ben-Hadad came forth to him, and he caused him to come up into the chariot. And Ben-Hadad said unto him, The cities which my father took from thy father I will restore, and thou shalt make streets for thee in Damascus, as my father made in Samaria. Then said Ahab, I will send thee away with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him and sent him away. So there's the covenant. Verse 35. Now, it doesn't go into all the details of a covenant, but we have on many occasions talked about all the things that went into making a covenant. Covenant was something that you were not supposed to break if you ever entered into it. It was considered very sacred. So he made a covenant with him and sent him away. And verse 35, And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor, and I love this next part, so a certain man of the sons of the prophet, in other words, he's, a, he's another prophet, right? He's anonymous. So he says to his neighbor, and his neighbor don't have a clue what's going on, what this prophet is even intending. He says to his neighbor in the word of the Lord. So he's basically saying, I have a word from God. Smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. Why should I, you know, I mean, put yourself in this guy's place. It's like, here comes this guy saying, smite me. You're like, I don't even know who you are. Well, I say he was a neighbor, but the prophet says, because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he would departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. You don't mess around with the prophet. How many ever heard somebody say, oh, there's a prophet? I want to go get a word. I don't want a word. Because look what happens. If you get a word, if God gave you a word, he's probably going to tell you he wants you to do something. And if you don't do it, maybe a lion would, you know, get you. If the lion came because the guy wouldn't listen to the prophet, prophet, what do you think is going to be your situation at the judgment if you didn't listen to God? You just ignored. Oh, I just thought that, you know, those Ten Commandments, I thought those were ten suggestions. <laughs> right? <laughs> I've heard that before. No, they're not suggestions. They're commandments. In fact, Jesus said, if you look upon a woman and lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. So he made it more difficult than the commandments of the Old Testament. But there will be a time, a period of judgment. I don't think that there's going to be a lion come and devour us. I believe we're saved by grace. But uh, we could lose a lot of rewards. And that, that's the thing I, th- I think that should drive us to, to want to serve God. And actually love ought to be, love of God ought to be what drives us. But verse 37, that now this prophet finds another man. Now, I don't know if the guy was standing there watching. He might have been the next neighbor. He might have saw the prophet come over to the neighbor and say, smite me. He goes, no, I won't. And a lion gets him, right? So he goes to the next guy. He says, smite me. And he goes, okay, 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 right? Now, I don't know what he saw. But he says, he found another man. He says, smite me, I pray thee. And the man smote him so that in smiting he wounded him. And a bear came and got him. No, that, that doesn't say that. It doesn't say No, he did what he was supposed to do. But the guy, the guy wounded the prophet. So, but the prophet asked for it, right? So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. Oh, now I see why he wanted to be wounded. He wanted to look like he came out of battle. They just had that great battle, right? So the prophet departed, waited for the king by the way, and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, and he said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle. And behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me. Now he's making up the story. It's not, it didn't really happen. But he's going to use his story to get a message to the king. So he says, you know, like Jesus spoke in parables, right? So he's telling this story. But the guy will know, the king, king will know that it's, the, the story wasn't true after he's done here. 
So thy servant went out in the midst of the battle. Behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. In other words, the guy said, Here's this prisoner. You watch this guy, and if he escapes, you'll pay for it with your life. That's what he's saying. Or you pay a talent of silver. And as thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. In other words, the guy escaped. All right? So he was supposed to watch him, and he was busy doing this or that, and the guy escaped. It's the story. And the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be. Thyself hast decided it. In other words, you have to die. Because the king believes the story. And then the prophet hasted and took the ashes away from his face. And the king of Israel discerned him that he was of the prophets. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life and the people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased and came to Samaria. So what's he saying? He said, because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man who I'm, uh, I appointed to utter destruction. Destruction. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the king had the, the king of Syria in his hand. But he let him go. And God says, I, put, I gave him into your hand because I appointed him to utter destruction. If you would have been a normal king and you had prophets of God, then the prophets of God would have told you, don't let him go. God's appointed him for destruction. Yeah. But see, he's listening to 400 other prophets that are not prophets of God. Right. And so God says, okay, you didn't want to kill him. Now you're going to get killed. And it's almost like I, I, it might even go back to, oh, you didn't want to smite me? Well, now the lion will smite you. So it all works together here. And the king of Israel went to his house, heavy and displeased, and came to Samaria. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria, that uh, reads a little rough again as well. What it's saying is, next to the palace of the king, there was this guy, Naboth, and he had a vineyard. And the king wanted his vineyard. Now, in Israel, you weren't ever supposed to sell your land. That was considered the inheritance of the Lord. You were never supposed to sell your, your family's land. Now, you could temporarily do it, until the, the, till ju- the seven years of Jubilee and then um, seven years had passed and then you would get your land back. This is the guy could farm it for seven years. But uh, so the, so the, the uh, evil king Ahab wants Naboth's vineyard. It's probably a, a beautiful vineyard. And Ahab, verse 2, 1 Kings 21, verse 2, And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs. Now, this guy's the king. He's probably got all kinds of vineyards. Why is he picking on this guy? Trying to steal his vineyard. He says, give me your vineyard, then I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or, if it seems good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. Well, that's well and good. That sounds fair, but the guy don't want to sell it. In fact, if he did, he would be violating God's uh, covenant. So Naboth says to the king Ahab, he said, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. In other words, it's written in the law. I can't do that. Even if I wanted to, I can't do it. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth, the Jezreelite, has spoken to him. For he said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid down upon his bed and turned away his face and he would eat no bread. Now his evil wife comes along. And when I say evil wife, this is not your typical wife. 
This is a woman by the name of what? Jezebel. Right? I mean, she was, she's the, if there's a, if there is a evil woman in the Bible, it's Jezebel. So Jezebel, his wife came in and said unto him, why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, and the king's refined unto the queen, because I spake unto Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said, give me thy vineyard for money or else if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not. Give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? In other words, who's the king? Aren't you the king? You don't listen to this pauper over here. Go take it. It's be basically, what, what's wrong with you? You're supposed to be the king. And then she said, Oh, you know what? Go ahead, arise out of your bed, eat some bread, let your heart be merry. Well, how did they make their heart merry? A little little wine, probably, right? I'm just thinking maybe a little wine went with that meal. I will give you, I, Jezebel said, I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal, sent the letters into the, unto the elders and to the nobles that were in the city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letter saying, Proclaim a fast, set Naboth on high among the people, and set two men, sons of Belial, that's sons of the devil, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou did blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. That's the plan. Now, Naboth, he's completely innocent. He's a, he obviously is a God-fearing man because he said, I can't do what you're asking because the covenant of God. Right. Jezebel always stirred him up, always pushed him into worse sin. When uh, people uh, will tell you, if you're a Christian and you're going to get married, don't marry a non-Christian, right? Why? Because they're going to pull you down. Well, a lot of people have the attitude, oh no, I'm going to pull them up. It doesn't usually work that way. Usually you have all this hardship and, and you pull them down. Well, in this case... They were complimenting each other because Ahab was dirty, rotten scoundrel and his wife was worse than him. And so if he had any redeeming qualities, she was pulling them down, right? They were both sinking in the mud and the quicksand. So the plan is to, tell, to have these two guys bear false witness against Naboth and say that he blasphemed God and the king and then stone him. Have the people of the land stone, and the men of the city, even the elders and the nobles who were the inhabitants in the city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them, and they proclaimed a fast, and set Naboth on, a, on high among the people, and there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him, and the men of Belial witnessed against him, even unto against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth, did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. And they sent to Jezebel saying, Naboth is stoned. And Jezebel said, I didn't even know he smoked. No, that he was stoned with real stones, right? You went talking about, like we say stone, and we're talking about somebody getting high. That's not what he said. He said, Naboth is stoned and is dead, just like you said. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. And her attitude is, Hey, it's Naboth's fault. He should have taken the money and gave you the land. It was a good deal. Yeah. Right? That, I mean, that's her attitude. And even though she's against God, the king's against God, it would have been a sin against God's covenant, but they can't see that. All they can see is, hey, I made him a fair deal, and he wouldn't take it. Don't think it's strange when the world reacts the way they do. Right. 
they're not going to see things the way Christians see it. And as time goes on, as we approach the end, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. In fact, you see all this political correctness going on now, right? Most of that political correctness has nothing to do with Christianity. It's the enemy. And the enemy's coming. Now, I don't know. I'm planning on leaving here soon. I don't know how long, how bad it will get. But that's the enemy. Anyway, it came to pass when uh, she said, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, Je- the Jezreelite, which he refused to, to give thee for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. And it came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth, Naboth was dead, Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. Now, he hadn't taken possession of it, but he was certainly headed that direction, right? And the word of the Lord, capital letters, came to Elijah. Well, there's Elijah. I wondered what happened to him. He's still there. The word of the Lord came. Now, Elijah didn't know what was going on, but the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, Arise, go meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he is gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. In other words, God's through the prophet, he's cursing them. He's saying, just what you did, you're going to have the same thing happen to you. The dogs licked his blood, innocent blood, the dogs are going to lick up your guilty blood, right? And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O my enemy? And Elijah answers, I have found thee because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. That you sold yourself. You know, you have, regardless of all your possessions, the most sacred, the greatest gift, the greatest thing that you have is your life to serve God. And he has sold himself to work evil. And the sight of the... I mean, if, if, if I was writing it, or I, if I was paraphrasing this book, this, this verse, I would say, Thou hast sold your soul to the devil. Do you ever wonder how so many of these rock stars and these Hollywood act, actors and actors, how do, they, how do they get on the top? I think they sell their souls. I do. I really, I really believe that. And a lot of them actually admit it, that they have. But I believe that's what he's saying. He said, you sold your soul. You sold yourself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee. I will take away thy posterity. I will cut off from Ahab, Ahab him that pisses against the wall. Kind of an expression to say, I'm going to cut off all your sons, right? Because girls don't piss against the wall. So he's talking about, he said, I'm going to cut off all your offspring, your male offspring. And in other words, you won't have any more offspring. And him that is shut up and left in Israel and will make you thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nibet, and like the house of Basha, the son of Aja, uh, for uh, the provocation where thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And these two people that were mentioned had led Israel into great sin. And, he, and Ahab's going to join them. They're, he's going to join them in the punishment that they got, right? Because God has really been provoked to anger because this, this king is so evil. And then verse 23, we got some mention of Jezebel here. Because God didn't forget the evil queen. In fact, the queen was, I think the queen was more evil than the king. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. And these are prophecies, by the way. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dogs shall eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. 
But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness. There it is again. Again, I I think it says, there's none like Ahab which sold his soul to the devil. In the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. Oh, Jezebel's getting some of the heat here too. He said Jezebel actually stirred him up. And he did very abominably in following idols according to all things as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Remember when Joshua brought the children of Israel into the promised land? And God said, wipe, all, wipe out all the Canaanites. Well, here's talking about the Amorites, but they were part of the Canaanites. The sins that, that made, the reason they were exterminated is because they were so exceedingly sinful, worshiping the, the false gods and doing all kinds of horrific things, like offering their children as, as sacrifices to the gods, to doing all kinds of nasty sexual stuff. He says, and he did very, uh, the king did very abominably in following idols according to all things as did the Amorites whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And there seems to be a change of heart here with Ahab. It came to pass when Ahab heard all these words. Now, Ahab's been through quite a bit of testing. If you look at you look at our past two messages, when when we had the three and a half years of the famine and the drought, and then the uh, the prophets of Baal, the big contest, the challenge, and Ahab, that didn't move Ahab's heart. None of it did. But it came to pass when Ahab heard these words, that he rent his clothes, he tore his clothes, put sackcloth upon his flesh, he fasted, he lay in sackcloth, and he went softly. He humbled himself. He wasn't so arrogantly, you know, walking around saying, I'm the king, I'm the king, I'm the king. All of a sudden, he realized he can't win. He's fighting God. And I think for, at least for a moment, he realizes that. And so the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, See how Ahab humbles himself before me? Because he humbles himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. You see how merciful God is? I mean, this guy is, I mean, before we, we, in verse 25, it says, there was none like Ahab who sold sold himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. He was so bad, and yet... When he turns and humbles himself and is asking for God to to have mercy upon him, God does. Now, he doesn't completely restore him, but he says, he says, I will not bring the evil in his day, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. And so in the next chapter, 1 Kings 22, verse 1, we read, And they continued for three years without war between Syria and Israel. So the king didn't die yet. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. Now, the king of Israel is still a, a bad guy, but king of Judah, he's a good guy. He worships God. The king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. And he said to Jehoshaphat, who was the king of Judah, he said, Will thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? In other words, he's asking for his help. I need an ally to take back this land. Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. In other words, Jehoshaphat, being a nice guy, and knowing that, knowing that they're all from the 12 tribes of Israel, they're all like brothers, they're all relatives, right? And so he says, I am as, just like you. Uh, my people are your, like your people. My horses are like your horse. And so he's making this peace, tr- uh, not tre- peace treaty, but an agreement. He's going to help the king. He's going to ally with the king. And so Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord 
today. And you notice that word, Lord, is in capital letters. In other words, he said, uh, to inquire, I pray thee, at the word of Yahweh today. In other words, the one true God. I want to know what the one true God says about this. So the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men. Where did we read about 400 men? Anybody remember? We didn't read it tonight. Remember the prophets of Baal? There were 450, and then there were the prophets of the Ashereth, which was the worship of the goddess. There were 400 of them. Now, it says Elijah had the 450 prophets of Baal killed. It doesn't say anything about the 400. You see, they're still around. They're in the office of prophets. The king is still listening to the 400 false prophets. He didn't learn anything. The king of Israel gathered the prophets, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into thy hand, the king. They gave him a good report, which is what false prophets do. Did you know? Don't be surprised. False prophets do not tell you the truth. That's why they're false. Right? right? Sometimes they can give you a little truth. They, in fact, Jesus himself said, some will come saying, I am Christ. In other words, they'll, they'll agree, I'm Christ, but they'll deceive many. So just because someone says they believe in Jesus does not make them not a false prophet. Right. You, we need to be careful as we walk this, the evil times that are coming. Because there's going to be a lot. Jesus said there are going to be many false prophets in that day. So they all said, go up for the Lord shall deliver it in the hand. And Jehoshaphat, he's a wise guy. I mean, not a wise guy, but he's a wise king. And he, he does love the Lord. And he leads his people to worship. The people of Judah, he leads them to worship the true God. And so Jeho- Jehoshaphat says, is there not a prophet of Yahweh? Besides these that we may inquire of him, is there any prophet out there that speaks to the true God? He doesn't want to hear what these 400 say. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, for he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. In other words, the king says, I don't want to ask that prophet because he never says anything good about me. That's like saying, you know, the, the wife says, uh, you know, I, 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 want to go, I want to go to the church down the street for the midweek service or something, right? And so the husband says, I don't want her to go to that church. I don't like that pastor. Every time I go to that the pastor says something about my sin I'm from the pulpit. <laughs> He's always beating me up about my sin. Well, maybe that's true, but don't blame the pastor. Blame the sinner, right? right. That's what he's doing here. He said, they, they, always, they wouldn't speak so evil of you if you would get straighten out your act. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten hither, Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes, their royal robes, in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before him. Now, what's that saying is, at the city gate... Right in front of it, there was a place that nothing's growing. There's no, there's no uh, uh, vineyard there. There's no trees. There's a, it's a void place. A void means empty. All right? So there's this place, a good place for a meeting, I would say. And that's what they did. And the two kings in their royal robes stood there in front of all the people, where all the people were gathered, so that they could hear, the people could hear what these prophets would say. And all the prophets prophesied before him. And Zedekiah, the son of Chenana, made him horns of iron. 
And he said, Thus saith the Lord, With thee shalt thou push the Syrians until thou hast consumed them. Horns of iron. So in other words, here comes this prophet with these horns of iron. You think, if you were the king... Wouldn't this kind of alarm you? That's what he's doing. He's like, with these horns, <laughs> right? You would think, duh, I don't want to go anywhere near those horns, right? But that's what he's doing. And he said, uh, with these horns, uh, uh, we shall push the Syrians until they have consumed them. And all the prophets prophesied sa- so saying, go up to Ram of Gilead, prosper for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah uh, spake unto him, saying, uh, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth, or one voice. Uh, Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. So the guy's trying to to give uh, this prophet of God a heads up. You know, this is what everybody's saying. So if you can just say the same thing. So what does Micaiah say? Is that as the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go up uh, against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. But he's being sarcastic, and the king knows it. And the king said, how many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? In other words, don't be sarcastic. Don't just say, mock me. Tell me what, you know, what the Lord's telling you. And he said, hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. So obviously he had some sort of a vision about this. And all the host of heaven was standing by him on the right hand and on the left. And the Lord said, and this right here, this, this little bit of scripture is a really good illustration of what goes on in the spirit world, by the way. You wonder sometimes why it seems like the whole world is against you. Well, look what happens. And you can read the book of Job. You get kind of the same idea here. So here's the Lord sitting on the throne. Verse 19, all the hosts of heaven is standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one say on this manner and another said on this manner. And then there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. I'll do it. I know what to do. And the Lord said, well, wherewith, or, or how will you do it? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. So there's a spirit, there's some sort of angel or something that's going to be the lying spirit in the mouth of all the prophets, for 400 prophets, right? Wow. What I think's going on, I think is Satan. <laughs> and I think Satan is said, I will get 400 of my demons to enter into the 400 prophets, and I'll tell them what to say. And they'll all lie. And that's what's going on. And that's why when you, when you look at the media, that they're all saying the same thing, and they're all lying. Because they're all joined together with the same demons. That's a little bit from the book of Ron. So, verse 23, Behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets, and the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. But um, Zedekiah, the son of Chenana, went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way went the spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? So, after this guy said, you know, this prophet talks about those iron horns, then the true prophet of God starts speaking, telling them the truth. I saw the Lord, and the whole host was before him on the left and on the right. And then this lying, this lying spirit came up there, said, "I will be a lying spirit." And the, the, you know, all the four hundred prophets. And this other prophet gets mad because all the attention's on the true prophet. You want to get, you want to make somebody mad in church. No, you probably don't want to. But the way the way to do it is take their seat. <laughs> do you ever notice we all probably pretty much sit in the same location? And people get uncomfortable. 
Especially, I mean, you look and you, you don't know this person. What are they doing in my seat? <laughs> Especially happens when you go up, you leave your seat, you go up here, you play the guitar, and then you come back down and somebody's in your seat. So I leave my bag in my seat. Anyway, but people get upset. And that, that's, uh, when, I, when I go to a new church, I'm afraid to sit down. Uh, you know, I like to sit in front so I can watch what's going on. But there's a lot of people, those front, front rows are pretty much taken. So you never know who you're going to offend. So anyway, this, this Zedekiah, son of China, went near and sm- he smote the prophet Micaiah on the cheek and say, says, which way went the spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? In, in other words, when did the spirit leave me? The Holy Spirit, leave me to go into you so you could speak for the Lord. And you'll notice it says here, he was actually saying, went the spirit of Yahweh or the spirit of Jehovah. So he said he was talking about the spirit of God, the true God. Well, he never had the true spirit of God. He's one of the ones that had the lying spirit, right? So Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see in that day when thou shalt go into the inner chamber to hide thyself. In other words, this false prophet is telling, trying, to, trying to make a statement saying that this prophet, that he's got the true message, this prophet does not know what he's talking about. So his response is, Behold, thou shalt see in that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. Hide thyself from what? Hide thyself from the wrath that's coming, going to come upon you. And the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and carry him back unto Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in prison, feed him with the bread of affliction and with water of affliction until I come in in peace. And Micaiah said, If, he's talking to the king, If thou return at all in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. In other words, you're not coming back, kingy boy. <laughs> you're not coming back. You're, you're dying. You go out there, you're dying. Now the king's really upset, right? And Micaiah said, if thou return at all in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, hearken, hearken, O people, every one of you. So remember, all the people are gathered there, Right? And so the true prophet of God turns to all the people. And he said, if the king returns, then I, didn't, I wasn't a true prophet. But if he doesn't, you all hear it. You know who's the true one and who are the 400 false ones. So he's challenging on them. But we don't even know who this, uh, well, we know Micaiah. We know his name, but I don't know much more about this Micaiah. Micaiah said, If thou return at all in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, O people, every one of you. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Now, I can't believe Jehoshaphat went along with this. Remember, they both had royal robes, right? Now, they're going into war. And the king, King Ahab, knows that He's supposed to get killed, right? So he says, I will disguise myself and enter into the battle, but you put on your robes. In in other words, if somebody's going to try to kill the king, I want him to think, it's like he's saying, put a target on your back, right? I'm going to disguise myself so nobody knows who I am. So he's, he's trying to avoid being killed. Is he scared because the prophet told him he's not coming back? He said, but you, you put your robes on and the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. But the king of Syria commanded his 30 and two captains, the 32 uh, captains that had rule over his chariots, saying, fight neither with small nor great, save only with the king of Israel. In other words, when you go into war, I don't, I don't want you to spend time trying to kill other people. I want the king dead. 
That's what he's saying. I want the king of Israel dead. So spend your time going after him. And it came to pass, when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they saw the royal robe, they said, surely it is the king of Israel. And they turned aside to fight against him, and Jehoshaphat cried out. And then they knew it wasn't the king of Israel. It was the king of Judah. And it came to pass, when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him, and a certain man drew a, a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Now, what it's saying here, he pulled back his bow, a certain man pulled back his bow, he said, on a venture. In other words, it was kind of like random. He wasn't aiming or anything. He just pulled back his bow, choom, and went right into the heart of the king. So a certain man drew his bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Wherefore he said unto the driver of the chariot, Turn thy hand and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. The battle increased that day. So they couldn't get the king out. And the king was stayed up in his chariot. And there was a standing up in his chariot all that time against the Syrians. And he died at even, or at even, in the evening. And the blood ran out of his wound into the midst of the chariot. And there went a proclamation throughout the, the host about going down of the sun, saying every man to his city and every man to his own country. Remember, that was the prophecy. The prophet said that would happen. For they are like uh, a, a flock, with, like sheep without a shepherd. So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria, and one washed a chariot in the pool of Samaria. Uh-oh. The dogs licked up his blood. Remember the prophecy? Yeah. The dogs licked up his blood, and they washed his armor according to the word of the Lord which he spake. Now the rest of the acts of Ahab, and all that he did, and the ivory house which he made, and all the cities that he built, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So the book of Chronicles is different than the, the book of Kings. You, you don't, they seem very similar, and they're talking about a lot of the same stuff, but you need them both. Okay, because they're, they're, some stuff is in one and not in the other. And they, what they're saying is oh, these other acts of Ahab are written in, in Chronicles, in the book of Chronicles. And so Ahab slept with his fathers, and Ahaziah, uh, his son, reigned in his stead. And Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, began to reign over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. And Jehoshaphat was 30 and 5 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 20 and 5 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azubah, the daughter of she, uh, Shilhi. And sometimes when you read these kind of things, you're wondering, like, oh, wait, wait, give me all those details, Right? I mean, if it's going to do me any sense, I really have to study to try to... Who are these people? Why are you telling me this? But it's very important that these things are throughout the Bible because that's how they can go from the New Testament. They can go from Jesus' genealogy all the way back to Adam because of things like this. And not only that, they know when Jesus was born... And by that, they can go backward through the whole Old Testament all the way back to the time Adam was created and know what year it was. And don't let anybody tell you about evolution and the, and the earth being created billions of years ago because according to the Bible, it was 6,000 years. Now, very few Christians, they say they're Christian, but very few are believing that anymore. The ones who believe the word, what were you saying? Pre-academic race. No, I'm not talking about pre-academic race. That's another. That's another thing. I'm talking. But going to Adam from Jesus from uh, from today back to Adam is only about six thousand years. And you can, if you lose the genealogy through the Bible, you can you can map it out, and you get a chronological Bible, and it actually has the dates in there, so you can uh, you can follow chronologically. You can follow it along. Verse forty-three, and he walked. Who walked? Jehoshaphat walked in all the ways of Asa, his father. Um, I wanted to turn. We'll come. We'll come right back to this. But I wanted to show you what it says about his father. Second Chronicles, chapter fourteen, verse two. And this is talking about Jehoshaphat's father, Asa, or Asa. How are you, Asa? 
And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He took away the altars of the strange gods in the high places. He broke down the images. He cut down the groves. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to do the law and the commandment. He took, a, took away out of all the cities of Judah the high places and the images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. Who could ask for more, a better king? See how good of a man this was? That was his Jehoshaphat's father. And he built fenced cities in Judah for the land had rest. And he had no war in these years because the Lord had given him rest. Therefore, he said to Judah, let us build these cities and let's, let, let's be like Donald Trump. And make walls. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with walls. The good king made walls to protect his people. And I give you that for free. <laughs> but I wanted you to see how this Asa was. Let's go back to 1 Kings now where we were. Okay, so verse 43, we were talking about Jehoshaphat. It says, he walked in all the ways of Asa, his father. In other words, he did good things too. Remember I said he was a good king. And he tried to be just like his father was. He walked all in the ways of Asa, his father. He turned not aside from it, to the left or to the right, doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, for the people offered and burnt incense yet in the high places. So there were still problems of people worshiping false gods in the high places. But what he was able to do, he did. That's what it's saying. He's a good king. He, God loves this king. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and his might that he showed and how he warred, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And the remnant of the Sodomites, which remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. Now, what were Sodomites? Giants. These were male temple prostitutes and they engaged in all kinds of sexual stuff including including sodomy right right and they were called sodomites they weren't they weren't called sodomites because they came from sodom they were called sodomites because that's the way they lived And those sexual sins that were wrong in the day of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were wrong in this time too. That's right. And so the king took care of them. And the remnant of the Sodomites, which remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. And there was no king in Edom. A deputy was king. And Jehoshaphat made ships of Tharshish to go to Ophir for gold. But they went not. Why? Because the ships were broken at Ezion Geber. Now, what do you mean the ships were broken? It doesn't say how they were broken. But some type of calamity, maybe a tornado, came through and broke up all the ships. It doesn't say, but it leaves it like nobody knows. These ships were just broke. They were just, it could have been just one angel that, that demolished the ships. But they were broken. And, and then said Ahizah, the son of Ahab, unto Jehoshaphat. Now the son of Ahab is just as bad as his father. And he says to Jehoshaphat, let my servants go with thy servants in the ships. But Jehoshaphat would not. Why? Because he's, he's beginning to learn to separate himself from the evil king. He's trying to be a good king. And he didn't wanna, want them, him to, to tarry along with him. And Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers, was buried with his fathers in the city of David. His father Jehoram, his son, reigned in his stead. And Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel and Samaria the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned two years over Israel. And he did, uh-oh, I'm not surprised by this, he did evil. The son of Ahab did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father, and in the way of his mother, who was his mother? Jezebel. Jezebel. 
and in the way of Jeroboam, who was the founder of the nation of Israel, the ten tribes of Israel became a nation, and he led them from the beginning to worship the bull god. And he told them, he said, these, he had the two statues of bulls, one on either side of the, of the, uh, the kingdom, these are the ones you're going to worship. God handpicked that guy and he turned on God right from the beginning. He did, so anyway, this, uh, this son of Ahab did evil in the sight. He walked in the way of his father, in the way of his mother, in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. For he served Baal and worshipped him and provoked to anger the Lord God of Israel according to all that his father had done. You would think after Elijah and in fact you take all three stories now with last three this week and the last two weeks all these great miracles you would think they would stop worshiping these false gods but what does his son do same thing his father did same thing his mother did worship the false gods They saw the 400 prophets were false. The 450 prophets that were killed, they were false. So what does he do? He served Baal and worshipped him. Now, Baal is is basically the devil through idolatry. For he served Baal, worshipped him, provoked him to anger, angered the Lord God of Israel according to all that his father had done. 